does look like I am in fact live. So, welcome everyone for another chess stream. Um, I think this is my first one in a while that is strictly educational and looking at some chess positions. In recent time, I've mostly been doing um, game commentary for our viewers. So if you guys like that, you can always go check that out. And of course, everyone's welcome to participate in our viewer playing events, which are hosted on Light Chess through the, the fan page. So if you guys want to know more about that, just comment, and I can post things in the chat. So today, we're going to be working on this kind of thing, where it's queen against rook. The reason that I chose this example is mostly because one of the viewers said that they wanted it, um, but the secondary reason that I chose this is because I think it's um, it's very challenging, but it's possible to systematically study it and get some um, some strategies for handling both sides. There's some key ideas that come up over and over again, um, despite the fact that this is one of the most complicated um, fundamental end games that you can play. The complication arises from just how powerful but different the queen and the rook are. So. The queen obviously has a degree of freedom that the rook does not have, so it's almost like twice as powerful. But the rook is really strong in the respect that it can control entire swaths of the board, so that means that it can control the king's position very well. It can defend its own king, but it can control a whole ranker file to allow the king to move progress into a new part of the board, so it can help the king um, avoid getting trapped on the edge, and it can also restrict the enemy king's movements. So. This is just kind of how the problem arises. And this first example is like a degenerate case. It's it's a study by Ponziani. Ponziani was alive and doing chess like a couple hundred years ago. I forget exactly when. Um, let me clean up this board to make it look a little better. One second. I just want to make everything look nice. a little bit better. So um, so in this first example, I think we can just treat this as a warm-up. It's actually black to play. So there are ideas for both sides, and this position illustrates some of the issues that can come up, even if you're on the stronger side. It's not as simple as just being like, okay, I'm going to check them a lot, and uh, eventually they'll blunder, or... Um, I'm going to bring my king close and eventually they'll get into a and get checkmated. It's not so simple. So I see that a few people are trickling in now. So if anyone wants to suggest um, an idea for Black's defense or a concrete series of moves, feel free and we can start there as a discussion point. In order to study this endgame systematically, I've identified something like seven Suksvang positions that I think happen a lot. A lot of the time you'll have to repeatedly put them in Suksvang in order to win with the queen. And in this example, it turns out it's not possible. There's something black can do to prevent white from ever achieving the Suksvang position. Anyway, we'll see what the Suksvang positions are in a little while. So, <clears throat> right now, the black rook is cutting off white's king. Sounds kind of useful. But if white wanted to make progress, they could try to bring their king up like this. So the real question is, why is this not just winning for white? If they just bring their king up here, and eventually put black in a position where they move the rook far away and get into a double attack, which is one of the main ideas. Or why are they not, you know, forced to play move like rook f7 and they get checkmate on f7, for example, like if the king was able to make its way over here somehow. Clearly black can't move the king. Right? All these squares are under attack by the queen. They could only play this move if they had moved the rook first, so they could like throw a check and then play king g7. 
And that sounds kind of intuitive in the sense that when you are defending any of these basic peace end games as a beginner, you generally want to resist your opponent by keeping your king as centralized as possible. If the king was on, like, d4, um, and if the rook was also nearby it, we'll talk about that. Um, for example, if, like, king was on d4, rook was on f4, then white would really have their work cut out for them. They would have to drive the king to the edge and then think about checkmate. So it's possible that um, a defense via the 50-move rule would be useful. Um, if you're not familiar with the 50-move rule, it means that in positions like this, where there are no pawn moves to make and no captures, after 50 moves for each player, it can become a draw. In a normal game, if you move the pawns, it resets the 50-move counter. That's why it's not like every chess game is 50 moves long. But here, you can't ever move a pawn to reset the timer. And also, whenever you make a capture, it resets the timer. So, like, if you play e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, your counter will be at 1 from the start of the game because you move the knights. If you play knight c3, knight f6, the counter will go to 2. So if you made, like, 48 more knight moves, you could shake hands and call it a draw. Um, but if you ever captured something, it would go all the way back. So that's kind of the issue. Um, but here, clearly, if they make any captures um, that are not like just winning the rook for free, then they would be losing their queen. So captures are very unlikely here as well. That's why 50 move draw is kind of what black's playing for. Now, with, with that in mind, um, they can also draw by repetition or stalemate. This is one of those examples. So if you weren't thinking about it before, you should think stalemate or repetition. How are we going to get that going? We can start with a check, um, but first I'd like to illustrate some typical problems. Um, the reason we don't make a move like rook b7, you know, this is just a blunder, I'm intentionally showing a blunder to illustrate the point. Um, the reason is that generally when you move your rook very far away from your king, you are going to lose the rook, either in like a one move double attack, or two move forcing sequence, or as much as like four move checking sequence. In this example, it's simple. So if you're watching the replay of this and you want to try to find it yourself and it's not easy for you, you can pause. But the answer is we can see attacking the rook, attacking the king. If the rook was really close, like imagine if the rook was on d7 when you made such a move, um, you could play king e7 and guard the rook, but since the rook's so far away, there's no defense like that. So we have to avoid these kinds of problems. Um, A move like rook c7 might be tempting because it doesn't actually lose the rook in one move. You might see queen d6, rook e7, and say, well, we didn't lose the game yet. We're, at, we're just marking time. No problem. But the problem with this is that white can bring their king to g2, and now you're, you're pinned, so you have to play a move such as, like, king e8. And after a move like I don't know. I think any move is fine. But maybe you could, like, throw this check just for safety, and then play King F3. Though the White King is getting steadily closer. That's the issue that I just wanted to point out. The only reason I was unsure about where to put the queen is that, like, as they move closer, they can start harassing the queen and it takes longer. But it's very hard to predict how long exactly it's going to take for you to get the winning position. So there's just a couple of issues that you can have. So the defense should start with rook h7, which is intuitive because we love checking. Um, but as I stated in one of my other videos, we don't always just check for, for no reason, right? Um, the counterintuitive aspect of rook h7 is that it, it forces them to play a move that we know is good for them. They have to play king g2. And after king g2, rook g7, it looks like they're just kind of waltzing in. They're going to probably run over to, like, d6. Although I drew the arrow like that, but 
you, you know what I mean. They'd probably run over to D6 and try to establish some kind of soup swap. Active king. So we have to actually prevent that. So if you want to see how we can tactically prevent the king from transferring over here, you can pause if you're watching the replay. Um, or if you're watching live, you can suggest something. Sometimes it helps when you are in a worse position to think about what the pieces that you have are good at. So the rook is really good at making pins and skewers and double attacks, you know, similar to the queen. It has a lot of power behind it. Um, and controlling entire lines in a defensive sense. So if they're trying to play this kind of sequence, their king is going to be lined up with the queen in this situation and in this situation, right? So we have to be able to take advantage of this. In other lines, this is also true. We have to think about how we can take advantage of these uh, untimely coordinations of king and queen. In some end games, it's actually impossible to lose if you're on the stronger side. Like, you can just play forever and see what happens. Um, like in, in rook versus bishop, for example. If you have a rook, they have a bishop. You really can't lose unless you, like, do something really terrible. Um, it's almost never... I mean, if you have extra pawns as well, you can do something terrible and lose. But if it's just rook against just bishop, you have nothing to fear. Because even if you lose the rook for free, it's a draw. Um, but this position's not like that. So rook f7 is the next move. And we have to see why they can't play king e4. It's because of rook e7. Attacking the queen and the king. Now they have to lose one of them, and it doesn't matter how. Like, they can try this. Who cares? This is the next move. And that's a draw. By insufficient material. No pieces, no game. Sometimes I wonder if kings even count as pieces, because they, like, have the unique property that they never leave the board. So anyway, we throw some checks, but you might s say cynically, well, so what? They're not going to play king e4. Well, at least that gives us a direction to calculate it. So the, the next move that makes the most sense to evaluate is king g4. And we have to find something for this. Now, obviously, we don't want to make moves like rook f1. This is not good. Um, because it gives white a move to... Um, fix the problem with bringing the king over the e file. They can play a move such as like I like to centralize my queen randomly, so I think I would play a move like this, um, and then you don't really have anything going on. So you need to find a better move. So rook g7 naturally suggests itself. Um, one of the main defending techniques is to keep your rook and your king very close. This is probably the simplest thing to remember if you're playing rook against queen. Just don't move your rook really far away from your king, and there's a good chance that your opponent will have no technique and not be able to beat you. And just try to stay, like, a little bit away from the corner to avoid the swoop Um Yeah, so rook g7 makes a lot of sense. Rook's near the king, uh, harassing white's king. King f5 would probably happen, although they could also have gone to, like, h5 or something. Um... Rook f7, starting to feel familiar, right? But we haven't actually repeated the position yet. Now here's the challenge mode. In this position, we have to find something. Because, like, rook g7 is kind of obvious, because we don't want to go far away. Um, but it's starting to look a little bit hairy, right? We just forced the white king to come all the way up into our king's grill. That could be an issue. So let's actually play rook g7, because no other move suggests itself. Like, they could, if they play, you know, if they play rook f4, they lose the rook in one move, just as an example. That's a double attack. Um, if they go on these other squares, they could get into a, a checkmating sequence, even. Like, um, here's an example where you lose the rook in, I guess, two moves. Um, queen c8, notice they can only go on this dark square. Rook's on a dark square. That's a hint. There's a double attack here. So, those are some, like, easy cases. 
What's up, Luis? Yep, insane in the end game. That's what we're doing today. So, Rook G7. So we have two cases, actually, before I start playing them on the board. We have this case and this case. Now, if you haven't studied like this before, you might be wondering, why aren't we studying this case and this case? And the reason is that they're not challenging moves. Like, after King F5, the position's clearly repeating itself, and that's what we want as the defending side. Right? They go back, we go back. And you could stick your hand out sometime around that. Um, so that's why we don't care about this one. Um, I'm arrow challenged today. There we go. And King, King H5, like, maybe you would consider this move if you thought that you could put them in Sugsvang by moving your king ag again. But it's not really going to happen because we, we know what they're going to play here, right? We're just going to give them a check and then repeat the position. So these just lead to repetitions. They're not really interesting. King H6 is interesting because it, it avoids Rook H7. And King F6 is interesting because it also avoids Rook F7. So um, finding the correct sequence here challenging. So let's analyze one at a time. Um, if anybody wants to suggest which move they want to do, look at first, um, just be my guest. Why am I like, so arrow deficient today? Sorry guys, I'm just having a hard time with the arrows. Well, they're really the same. So let's just take a look at, for example, um, King H6. I think that this might be the most obvious choice. So why not analyze the obvious choice? Um, the idea here is that if you play a move like, let's pretend you just play rook f7 and go back. Um, this is pretty much a Sukhswan. The The reason is that after a move like, well maybe I should explain how I'm arriving at this. So I don't analyze this ahead of time. This is just kind of like interesting. Um, so when you're trying to identify a move that puts your opponent in Sukhsvan, which is really, really important for this kind of endgame, um, you need to imagine what it would be like for them to tr find a move after um, you have played. So if you play Queen E5, right, this is the move that I'm thinking about. Let's pretend that I haven't evaluated it yet. Queen E5. Um, I'm asking myself, what will Black do in this situation? And yeah, rook, rook h7, we'll, we'll definitely get there. So, it, after rook f7, queen e5, um, they're basically in Zuxon. You can see they can't move their king anywhere. I'll just go quickly because Luis has a very good suggestion. And if they if they play, if they move their rook far away, it'll probably lead to a double attack. So you guys can work that out yourself. Um, and if they play this move, sorry, just play it on the board, then we can do this. And you know this is really good. So this this is a good sign for me. That's why I would play queen e5. Because I see if they can't move their king, and they have to move the rook kind of far away, it could be a problem. But Luis is on to something, right? We don't have to play this kind of passive rook f7 stuff, which might even work, actually, against someone who's not very skilled in this kind of position. But rook h7 is forcing, right? We should look for the forcing moves. It doesn't matter if you think it's going to be bad. We should at least look at it. It doesn't take that long. So... Here, they have just a couple of options. The first option that's obvious is if they take the rook, but this is exactly what black is playing for. It's stalemate, right? If you don't know stalemate, you gotta do your research. Stalemate means they have no moves that they can possibly make. The queen covers all of these, and the king covers this one. And it's their move, and they only have a king. If they had other pieces, not stalemate, but this is stalemate. So, that's cool. Rook h7 is a very nifty trick. And it, it takes advantage exactly of the things that make the rook really great. Uh, but now you might be saying, like, well, they don't have to take the rook. What if they just go back? But, um, I hate to break it to you, but there's, like, two different ways to, to draw here. We can draw by repetition, because we've been here before. Or we can do this, which is even more cool, which also takes advantage of um, the issue that queens and kings have. When they're lined up, they're vulnerable to tactics. So he takes h6, that's another stalemate. So you got options. Brand new whip just hopped in. So rook h7 is a really good defense against king h6. So should we just play all, the, all these moves without knowing what's going to happen? Probably not. We should at least analyze king f6 ahead of time. Um, but after seeing the last variation, it should be really easy to pick out what, what the move is here for black. 
So if you're watching the replay, you could pause and think about it. Um, but if you're alive, feel free to suggest the move in the chat. How is Black going to survive this one? It's another stalemate. They're lined up like this. Our king is trapped. Very convenient. So we get rid of the only piece that can move. Rook g6. So that's it. This is a drop. They have to take it, or or they could not take it, just to be like passive aggressive. But if they don't take this, it's going to be a, a big problem for them. So this is how we, we do this one. This is a very degenerate case though. This is one that illustrates a lot of tactical ideas. This is not a typical scenario. Um, although I think I have defended with this technique in a real game before. Well, online, which is kind of like half real. It's like saying I, I used this technique in a dream once. Um, so anyway, this is a really cool example. Very simple though. The next one is a lot more common, but not simple whatsoever. So. I think that if you're not accustomed to analyzing these very difficult end games like the knight versus bishop and so on, um, it's good to learn a few basic examples and then try to grow your understanding from there by, by playing out similar positions against the computer. So I'm not going to be playing against the computer today. Yeah, it was a really neat puzzle. Uh, this one's even neater though, so if you have time, stay in. Um, yeah, so. What was I saying? I forgot already. Oh yeah, so you should play against the computer. I won't be doing it today, but I really recommend that you guys pick some of these examples that I did and just make the computer um, defend against you over and over again. That's a good way to practice. So for this one, um, basically this is a pretty good position for white. The the technique that we saw in the Ponziani study just now for black does not work because the queen is on a more ideal square. Black can't start a checking sequence. I mean, it's also white's move, so it's kind of moot point. But if we if this were black's move, they wouldn't have any special tactics. Like, they couldn't play rook b6 because there's queen b6. Even king b6 is fine. Rook c7 is nothing because of queen c7. Um, and they also can't really easily move their king. Um, we'll see all those details in a minute. Because it turns out that the winning technique for white in this position involves getting this to be black to play. So that's really the first puzzle. And that's the only thing that's simple about, about this whole exercise. Finding out how you can get to this position with it being black's turn is the simplest part, and the rest is just kind of crazy to me. We're going to put them in Sugswang over and over again. And if you don't know what Sugswang is, um, it's a word from German that means compulsion to move. It means a situation in which any move your opponent makes um, critically weakens their position. It's a very advanced, usually end game concept. Um, so we want to make black play here. Um, the way that we could come to that conclusion independently, you know, not just me telling you or, or you whipping out a book, um, is you could ask yourself that question, like, what if black plays? We already saw that, that these moves are not useful, so the forcing tries are kind of passe. Um, by the way, rook a7 is funny because queen d8 is main one. Um, I didn't really mention that before. So the forcing tries don't work, and if the forcing moves don't work, and the king moves don't work, for example, king c8, um, King C8 runs into this double attack. Well, it's not a simple double attack. I mean, we'll get into this later. So King C8 doesn't look very good because they're trapped right in front of the king. U usually I like it when I'm attacking and my opponent's king is like face to face with me like this. Um, just to make it general. Um, but also you can see that they might have to move their rook far away from their king. And since we already know that double attacks usually happen under such circumstances, um, it's a sign that it would be really great if black was forced to play here. So the way that you reach this position with black to play is with a triangulation. You can do it in 
maybe two different ways, but I only remember like or I mean, two ways that are like really different from each other. Um, but the way that I remember it is with forcing moves. So we've got options. We can play either queen d8 or queen e5. The other forcing moves don't make a lot of sense. It might be tempting to play um, queen a6 now that I'm looking at it. But I think this runs into rook c7. And actually, we're almost in stalemate, Bill. Let's, let's look at that quickly, just for fun. So this is attacking the rook. After rook c7, um, white needs to make a move. And most of the moves that white can play are good. But I think the move that's the worst is also the most tempting move. After king b6, which looks looks good, looks like you're closing it for checkmate somehow, um, it's black to play and draw. So if anyone wants to suggest a move, feel free. If anyone's watching the replay, you can pause here and look for this tactical moment. It's also um, important to always work on your tactical game, even if it's from other areas of chess, um, it's important to have a high tactical awareness to win the queen versus rook end game. There's some general principles, but it's almost all calculation. It's not, not f6, it's, it's c6, but yeah, Ari, that's, that's correct, and, and good to see you in the chat. It's c6, and it's the same as the Ponziani study, but slightly different. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. We're doing something that's a little little bit challenging, I hope. Um, yeah, so queen a6 looks good, but it's just not working. It, it becomes similar to the Ponziani study that we just looked at. So we got options. We got queen d8 to look at and queen e5 to look at. So if we play queen d8, they can only play king a7, so that's kind of tempting. But how are we going to return to a5? That was kind of the stipulation um, for those who are just tuning in. We wanted the same exact position, but with the other side to play. We can't exactly get that. I think here the, the best way we can do it is with queen d4. Um, let's say they go exactly back to b8. And then queen h8, they have to put queen a7. And then queen a1, they have to go back to b8. And then queen a5. But this seems a little bit, a little bit convoluted. I mean, it, it's fine, it works, but um, I think you can just do it directly. There's no reason to play queen d8 when we could play queen e5. They can only play this move, or you know, basically similar moves. Queen a1, only move that keeps in touch with a5. That's our destination. And then here we go. So. You, you guys might be interested to know that this position is, I think it's the only named position in the Queen versus Rook endgame. And if you had to guess who it's named after, I bet you could, because everything is named after Philidor. The guy was like probably 1900, but, uh, I mean, 1900 in like modern ELO terms. Um, but he had a very great passion for studying these endgames, so a lot of things bear his name, and also the Philidor opening. So here's yet another Philidor position. Um, the Philidor from Queen versus Rook, as opposed to the Philidor position from the Rook versus Rook. There's something up with this guy in the heavy pieces. He has really wanted to know everything about them, I guess. So anyway, um, Philidor studied this a long time ago, like in the Napoleonic days. Um, I think I've even read that Philidor once met Napoleon at the that famous chess cafe, but I don't I don't remember if that was true or not. People make up all kinds of things. So now that we've arrived, you know, we did the thing. We went here, and then here, and then here. A triangulation. Or as I like to call it, a grilled cheese. It just reminds me of grilled cheese. I'm so hungry. So, um, yeah, we've arrived here in this position. And black has to make a move. Either they have to move the king, or they have to move the rook. So let me just peek at my notes to see what I want to show first. Um, I, would, I usually like to choose what the easiest thing. What's the easiest thing? Well, 
let's say they play like rook b3. I think this is probably an easy one to analyze. But this one I'll, I'll, I'll make it as an exercise because we haven't really done any of the, the challenging double attacks so far. We've just done the like one move double attacks. So in this sequence, um, there's a variation in which they lose the rook right away. And there's a variation in which they um, get into a checkmating attack. So we have to choose again between these forcing moves. We shouldn't play anything that's not really forcing because if if we play something kind of passive, like, I don't know, queen a6, first of all, um, well, I guess it's just simple. Like, if we play like queen a6, it's, it's not very fun. They'll just start checking you, and you'll have to go away, and then you'll have to rebuild your, um, your good attacking position. By the way, I've noticed that it's often pretty good to keep the rook and the king aligned when you're defending. Like, if you must move it far away, you keep them on the same rank or file. Because it's harder to um, double attack in that situation. So anyway, it's not queen a6. Queen d8 is probably fine, but, but the move that comes to my mind first is queen e5. I, fr I like to set up attacks using the central squares. So keeping an eye on these central squares is often pretty useful. Um, the, 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 the really not interesting case, just if you want to brush up on your maiden ones, we've got three different maiden ones here. Um, so you can check that out in the replay. Um, but they really are going to play something like this. Alright, let me calculate a bit. Okay, so here it's either mate in two, or double attack in two. So, you could put the answer in the chat, or if you're watching the replay, pause your video and look for it. And it's all forcing. All checks. I like to solve these backwards. I look at this guy, and I'm like, okay. How am I going to attack this square and also a square that the king is on? Not necessarily where the king is on right now, because that would be like here. Sorry, I'm just struggling. Yeah, we want to attack this guy. And if we were to attack the king as well, it would be from f7. Or it would be from a4. Or it would be from a2. Um, I think that's all of them that makes sense. Um, so we would try something like that. But it's also good to look at auxiliary ideas. Like, what if we force the king to go here? Or what if we force the king to go here? How would we double attack in that situation? And then we get some additional key squares to think about. If, if the king is on a8, we can use this one. If the king is on a6, they actually have bigger problems, so I'm just not going to highlight those. So, with this hint in my mind, I would find a way to access those squares. F7 is most tempting, because, you know, if they do basically nothing, they lose the rook. So I would try to get on a square like that. So queen g7 is forcing. It brings me there. I like it. This move is in touch the most with the squares that I highlighted. So it's my first choice. Um, after king a8, it's a double attack in one move. Um, you have to see one extra thing, though. So queen g8 is a double attack, and you can probably just, like, wrap it up here. But there's always that one person who's like, but wait, what if they play this? So you should pause the video and look for the checkmate in one, if you like that. Um, this is a very common checkmate. The situation where you force them to block with the rook to avoid losing the rook, and then you trap them on the edge. Even if the king is not in an ideal situation. Usually the king's like slightly more ideal, like here or here. But even on c6, we can get some good checkmates. So anyway. Um, that's one variation. And if they go here, you just have to remember that it's like the same deal. Throwing these checks from far away. Checkmates. So, so queen e5 is very effective in that sense, right? Um, and so we were analyzing king a7, but what if they, what if they play king a8? 
turns out they're they're not the same. Um, I think it would be very tempting to play queen h8 and just like cross your fingers that they'll play rook b8 so you can checkmate them on a1. Um, but I mean that'll probably work. You know I didn't really analyze this. It's just they they shouldn't block with the rook. That's very silly. It would go here. But then we can uh, transpose into the other variation we just analyzed because we get this double attack. So I guess they're actually pretty similar in that way. But there's, there's another winning idea that I liked here. Um, I thought it was illustrative of um, some of the fundamentals in this endgame. The move is king c7. And it's basically just threatening mate. You know, we, we're controlling b8 now, so we're threatening this move. Um, so they can't move the king, they have to move the rook. But they also can't play rook c3, and rook b7 is not really useful because of king c8. Then they just have the same problem again. So this, this is a cool, cool concept. Frequently, when the opponent defends by putting their king very far away, I mean, putting their rook very far away from their king, it's, it's good to try to control the, the checking squares simultaneously so that you can bring your king to a position such as c7. So this is a winning technique. Okay. So all this arose from this first critical Zugzwang that we're analyzing. This is the first one. Um, they also could have played rook b1, but after queen d8, there's a checking sequence. King a7. And I think you could probably figure it out by now after the, the technique that we showed for the last. Uh, but if you want to search for it on your own, you can pause, or, uh, well, if you're watching the replay, you can pause. But yeah, it's queen d4, using a central square. Queen h8. And now, finally, the double attack. And they can't play rook b7, because of king takes, I'm sorry, uh, the king guarding b7. So yeah, this is an elementary example. Doesn't feel elementary, because this is hard, but it's, it's fundamental. So this next thing is really hard too. Um, it's something called the third rank defense. So the third rank defense, I think this is also a, um, a technique that has a similar name to other techniques, so you might just want to remember as the third rank defense in the queen versus rook. So um, there's multiple ways to proceed here, but it's possible to slip into a draw. This is a situation where winning is not really trivial. In in the previous examples, like in this one, right, in our Ponziani study, um, it was a draw because black was able to start an attack from far away because the king was not there. In this Philidor position, um, white was able to win because their queen was ideally placed and they brought their king really close. But in this third rank defense, their king is not necessarily um, in the best attacking position yet. And nor is the queen necessarily in the best attacking position. So it gives black time to try to erect some kind of fortress. Not necessarily one that holds by force, but one that can try to push the game into the 50 move rule territory. Where if you take too long, you get a draw. And so it's called third rank defense because the essence of it is that even if your king gets pushed to the back rank, you're going to keep your king on, on the third rank or file um, that's near your king. And you always try to keep them in touch, right? You you won't ever put the rook more than like two squares away from the king, because um, unless you have some really great reason to, um, because if you go too far, you get into double attacks. But one square away is not too far, because if the if the rook is, for example, like um, I don't want to pick c6 because they could take it one move. But let's pretend the rook is on like um, c5, and they play a move like their queen just flies onto a7, double attack, right? You could always bring your king to guard the rook. It's one move away, I mean one square away, but you still can make it happen. And by staking out the third rank, it gives you some maneuvering room. You're less likely to get into soup spot. So if you're defending this, the third rank defense is a really good choice. So we got options. I'm only going to go into the side variations here if you guys really want to look at that. Um, well, let's just start with the like common sense, good stuff. Bringing the king closer. I think king c2 is the most sensible move. Um, and so black will 
probably try to establish this third rank defense somehow. Right now they can't because um, the queen will take the rook. So they'll try to maneuver to get, get some purchase on those good squares. So rook d6 is my main line. Um, other moves work as well. Another thing to keep in mind is that you don't you don't necessarily have to bring the rook to the king's third rank. You could also bring the king to where the rook is already on the third rank. So this might be another technique that you would use. Obviously, you won't cross check, but like we'll we'll bring the king behind the rook that's already on the third rank. So in some of my side variations, I play a move like rook b6. I think no, not rook b6. What did I? Let me check my notes real quick. I remember I, check, I, remember I checked out one. Try to just illustrate the point. I think it shows rook h6. Not, not h6. Like, um, no, not f6. This one's a mistake because of queen a1 double attack. Uh, maybe not in this position. <laughs> I, I remember when I, when I was preparing for this, I, I looked at a bunch of examples and I tried to show some where the king runs to the side. It might be in my um, auxiliary example. So anyway, king c2, let's just take a look at rook d6 since that's my main line. Oh, I think I chose rook e6. Yeah. So after rook e6, um, queen a8, king b4, king b7, king c5, you can see that the king is reaching contact with the rook. So they're still doing that third rank defense. This was my example for that. The king can run to the rook, or the rook can run to the king, whatever's easier. Just don't make them move too far away and get in a double attack. But yeah, rook d6 is my main line. King c3 is good, because whenever you get the kings kind of close together, you start to create friction, and they might get into Sukhsvang, so this is a good idea. Queen's conveniently controlling the checking square. Don't forget it. Um, <clears throat> now we have more than one way to proceed. After king b5. You'll notice that um, black is able to get this third rank defense basically no matter what here. Um, as long as they don't blunder the rook, they can get it. But it doesn't mean that they're going to survive. It just means that they're able to put up good resistance. Queen h5. I think I remember queen h5 being a noteworthy move. No, in another one of my examples, it's it's noteworthy. So anyway, um, here we bring the king closer still. This part's all kind of simple. King b4 is necessary. King d5 is a blunder. Oh, why does it show the question marks on the board? Maybe I should get rid of that in my notes. So if you're if you're just looking for the one move tactics, you can pause the video in the replay to find the skewer than the shoes on the other foot. So we don't play king d5. Just be cautious. We also don't play king d4 because this kind of doesn't create that friction that I said we want. When I'm attacking the king, I like to create this situation where we are fighting for control of these three. This usually favors the attacking side in almost all positions. So they have to retreat the king. And now we're actually looking for a Tsukhsvang. This is the second Tsukhsvang position that I selected for us to take a look at. So if you guys want, you can pause if you're watching the replay, or um, say it in the chat what you think the Tsukhsvang move should be. How are we going to make it so that they have to make a move that weakens their position? In, in my mind, weakening the position means moving their king to the the eighth rank or the whatever, just like to the edge of the board, um, or moving their rook really far from their king. So we're looking for a move that makes them do one of those two things. Restricts their options. Or if it forces their rook to leave the, the third rank. In this example, when we say third rank, we mean this one, the these squares. Third relative to the side of the board where the king is hiding. I didn't really think about this before, but I think also it, it's not fair to say that if they play king b6 or king b7 that they're maintaining a third rank defense in this direction. 
The reason is that when you establish this third rank defense, what you're trying to do is prevent the king from penetrating behind that rook barrier. But you can see here that if they try to switch sides and do a third rank defense on, on this edge, it doesn't make sense. The king's already penetrated there. So they can only really maintain on the sixth rank here. Okay. So the move that I analyzed is queen d5. Makes sense. Restricts the king's options. They can't go here. They also can't go here, which is really important to see. Pardon me. And if they play a move like king b6, I think as I just alluded to, a move like queen d7 is really, really good because it forces them to stay in this unfavorable third rank defense. White king's already in. It's not working. So I really like that. Um, so the, the next question is, well, first of all, why can't they play king b7? If anyone wants to uh, shoot me an answer, feel free. It's pretty simple, but just to like consolidate the memory of what the, the tactical motifs are here. You could always hit me with the move. Notice this pin. Queens are good, diagonal pins. Rooks are diagonally challenged. White has another piece that's not diagonally challenged. Well, challenged in a different way. Not very far, but can put the pressure on. So this is going to win the rook. Sad for them. So that's why they, they are very restricted in their king moves, and they have to consider moving the rook. And we want to make them move the rook, so they might get into a double attack. Um, let's see, what's the most common sense move? I think probably the move that people would almost definitely plays rook d6. I don't think any other move really makes a lot of sense. Um, for example, this loses the rook in one move. And rook h6 is an example of um, rook really far away. I think that they're going to get into a double attack in a couple of moves. Well, they, they could save themselves, maybe. Let's see, queen e5. So if they stay on the seventh rank, they they just lose the the rook. So they have to go here. But this allows the white king in. So this is not not helping. Okay, so rook h six is not good. So rook d six I think is definitely like the most common sense move that you would probably see in this um, critical second suit on position we're looking at. So after rook d six. I think queen e5 is tempting, but it's also kind of slow. If they had to move their king somewhere, if they like, I don't know, if they had to play king c7 here, like if they had to come here, this would be really good. But this is just moving the same position down the way, just kind of kicking the can. So, so I don't know. Queen e5 is, is probably easy to remember though. It's a little slow, but e easy to remember is important in these positions. You could also play queen f7. Um, with the idea that um, we control the back rank. And this disrupts their ability to coordinate. But, yeah, let's look at the easy one. Queen e5. We're kicking the can a little bit here. Um, rook e6 is also good, but let's just analyze one thing. Okay. So this position, they also have to move the rook a little bit farther away. So here's just like a strategic puzzle, not necessarily tactical in nature. What should white play here? So hit me up in the chat. What's white gonna do? We can't double attack the rook, clearly. We can't occupy the back rank that easily. I mean, we, we could, but I think there's maybe a better way. We could play queen h8, but that's not the first move that comes to my mind. The reason I don't really like queen h8 is I think that um, black could waste our time with a checking sequence, and we're trying to avoid the 50 move rule. Okay, so I think the easiest move here is queen g7. Because 
it forces the king to the edge of the board, and that's a big step in winning positions like this. We, in order to get them in Tsuxwang for real, we usually need them to be stuck on the edge. So, king e8. And they still have their third rank defense thing going here, um, and our king is not able to get in. So our task will be to, to bring our king inside. So queen c7, harassing the rook. Makes sense. Um, they could have really... So they actually can only play rook h6, I'm pretty sure. Because if they play like this, there's a one-move double attack. Right? If they play this move, then this gives white a tempo to play king e5, which is not not obviously good, but, but it is good. It at least shows that... Um, Rook g6, it doesn't have independent value from rook g6. But if they play rook g6, um, we're still going to play king e5. And th this is a good situation because it's this is basically like suit swap. So let's go to the main line, which is very similar. Alright. So even after rook h6, which is probably the best defending move, hardest to get into a double attack from, after king e5, this is kind of the third suit song position that I thought we should remember. When, when they're trying a third rank defense, and you can't break through, this situation will give you a Tsuxuan. Because if they move, remember that there's only one really good rook square, right? Um, they could go to g6 or h6, but after king e5, rook g6, I think king f5 is, is the move. Um, so they're only able to bounce between these two. So rook g6 is the move. Um, if they go anywhere else, there's double attacks or one move captures, so they have to go here. And uh, it's not king f5. Here it's the fourth Suicide position to remember. So these two are kind of like twins. If you have this position, where they have the rook on h6, the Suicide arises by putting your king on e5 in line with their king. And when they start toggling between the only two good squares that they have, the next Suicide, this is hard to find, it's queen c4. I'm not even sure how to like explain. It's just like once you look at it, you know you know it's good. Um, so they have to play king e7 because if they play rook h6, they run into some tactics. So you might want to pause here and look for the tactics. They can't toggle anymore. No more rook g6, rook h6 stuff. So it should be queen g8, very forcing. It doesn't really matter what they pick. Like, they're the same. This is a double attack. Not good. So, they have to play king e7. Um, I guess they could play king d7. No, king d7 runs into a double attack as well. So that's another cool double attack. Um, so king e7 only move. Now here you could take a draw if you wanted by queen c7, queen c8, but you could always have taken a draw by just taking the rook, so that, that's not really so interesting. Um, so now at, from here there's kind of a, a checking sequence to remember. When they've avoided all of your problems, they have a rook on g6, king on e7, your queen's on c4, your king's on e5. You have to remember this part, kind of. I mean, you, you can calculate it too, but I think it's easier to remember. Usually these end games arise in time pressure in modern chess. In the old days, they had adjournments, so you would just go home and think about these really complicated positions, and then come back and do what you think is good. Um, but in the computer era, we can't do that, so they mostly are like forcing people to um, play these out with like five minutes on the clock, which is just insane. Um, it's kind of dark in here. I'll be right back. have a, a perfect setup right now, um, so I hope you guys can just forgive me for the low, low, uh, low production at the moment. Um, I'm kind of like between places and don't have a perfect streaming setup, and probably won't for a while. So I want to highly hello. I hope I said your name well. So, so here's the checking sequence, right? So the first move is on a dark square, and the rest of the moves are on light squares. 
so this is kind of interesting. The sequence is H4, I had something in my notes that I wanted to say, what was it? Yeah, only H4 is the dark square. That was the thing I wanted to say to try to help you remember. So this is the only dark square in the checking sequence. And then after H4, it goes H7, and then F5. Okay, so we go from C4 light to H4 dark to H7 light to F5 light. So if you can remember this pattern, this will probably just make it easier for you than like calculating the whole thing. So we give a check. And one of the ideas that can help you remember this too is that if they play king d7, we play queen h7. So they have to play this one. And we don't have any other checks, so this one's kind of easy to find. Um, if they move their king somewhere, we take the rook, so they have to play this one. This is our only really useful check. I mean, there's queen h5 too. Um, after queen h5, I think that they would play, oh, I don't know why I played h6, I'm sorry, um, let me delete that, yeah, after queen h5, they would not play rook g6, after which king f5 is winning, they would play a move like king e7, so this is why we're not just throwing another check, we're playing queen f5, and the whole point of this checking sequence is to bring the king in further, so we finally break through the third rank defense. But it took like three, it took like four swoops to get here. Now after this, they, they don't have any good moves, so they have to move the rook far away. And here's our fifth swoops position that we should, we should remember. This one's actually easy to remember, because it, it, it turns into a very um, geometric formation at some point. So queen d5 is the start, this is a swoops because after, so here's the easy to remember one. This configuration is Sukhsvan. We want this to be black to play, with everybody lined up. Just remember this lined up formation, and you'll remember that you can get a Sukhsvan like this. This is this is our goal. The goal is right here. We've broken through the third rank defense. Our king is on the third rank. We use the diagonal Sukhsvan. So how do we get this position to be black to play? You might want to just think about that yourself for a moment. more than one way. So I think this part's actually kind of hard to remember. But also, like, black's very limited in their options. So even if you, you try and you do it in an inefficient way, probably it's not a big deal. Like, let's say we play queen d8, and then they have to block with the rook, because if they play, like, king g7, then we do king g5 and queen h5. This is winning, because they have to move the rook here and get into a checkmating attack. So, so they have to play rook f8, because you can see that that was no bueno. Um, and here, the way that I like to get back to that position and make it black to play is with queen d4. See, I don't go on d5, because if you go right on d5, you're repeating the position. You're not making it their turn. So we don't want that. So I go to d4, which, you know, controls some critical squares, keeps some attacking chances alive. There's like a hint that queen g4 could happen. So they play rook f7. Um, they really don't have other moves. Let's, let's just see, for sake of argument, king to h7. Here we can play king e7, attacking the rook. And after they go somewhere, um, queen a7, attacking the rook and the king. Discover attack on the king. And this is going to end in like, checkmate pretty soon. Because if they go here, we go here. And if they go here, we go here. So. So king h7 doesn't work, they, get, they just get checkmated differently. So rook f7 is it, this is the challenging defense, but then once it's black's move, our mission's accomplished. 
Now you, you might be wondering still, like, why do we, why do we really want this to be black to play? So let's just take a look at one example. Let's say they go here. King f6 is check. This is another way that you can remember the, the diagonal thing. We want it to be black to play because they can only move the rook, and when they do, we get this ex this very good king placement, which we've already seen in another example. And then the the rook winning sequence is the same as in a previous example, but rotated. Okay, so I have a bunch more examples, um, but they're mostly like just very complicated scenarios with an extra pawn. Um, let me see. Is this one good? Let me just check. Oh, this one, there's another to explain position, I think. Let me just quickly check my notes. Another useful one to know that's also easy to remember. Just checking. Okay. Yeah, th there's a couple other Sukhsvangs in this example that are useful. So I'm going to do this one just as like show and tell, and then we'll wrap up for today. So, in this one, rook f8 is kind of a weird move. Um, I guess it doesn't matter, though. The reason I, I included this is that it's kind of like the Philidor position, because they have this third rank rook thing. Um, but they move the rook really far away from the king. And sometimes, they move the rook really far away from the king, and you can't punish them immediately. This is an example like that. Um, but there's still some good things that you can do. Basically, we want to bring our king in at some point. So all these checks were to prepare king d4. Okay. Now, all that part was just to, like... We, we could analyze that, but I think it would take a long time, so I just want to speed things along a bit. So after we reach this position, there's an excellent move for white. And there's a general idea behind it that I mentioned earlier. So we want the king to get in, right? So we tried to bring the king through d4, um, and that forced them to bring their king to the, the f-file. But we want to make further progress than that, right? So right now they keep coming back to try to prevent us from just walking up with the king. If we just play a move like king d4 right now, they will probably play rook d8 check, and then come back to f8 because this is a stable formation that I mentioned before. So we can't just waltz in. And the reason is that these checks are annoying. So we want to control the checking squares, but not just any checking squares. For example, I would not go back to e6 to control c8. Sorry, arrow challenge. I would not just play queen e6 to play king c8 because I want to control the squares that allow my king to get close to their king. So I really want to control these squares. Because the rooks can only check a king on the e-file from these places. So I would play queen h5. Now they have to go here. Um, king e4 is bad because of this check. And they cannot step on the f-file. So it ruins their defensive setup. They want their king on the short side, um, but they have to play king d5 because of this tactic. As soon as you lose. Okay, so king g3, basically forced. Now we can bring the king over. Because if they check on the d file, we just don't care, right? They play this, we play this, and if they play this, we play this. So rook f3 is the move du jour. And after king e4, um, this is starting to look a lot like Suxwa, as that old Christmas song goes. They have to move the rook somewhere far away, or else start giving checks, but the checks run out in one move. Um, if they go far away, we're, we're thinking about double attacks probably, because white's king is super close to black's king. Um, if they do this though, after king e3, it's just not coming together. Anyway, this is very complicated, so I don't want to get into what happens after, for example, rook a4, which is a very interesting move. So let's just look at rook g4, which is kind of interesting. Next is queen e5. And here, um, 
we want a position like this with black to play. So this is actually an, our, um, I think it's our seventh Suksung position. Oh, actually, um, in one of the sidelines, I forgot to mention, there's, there's a six Suksung position. Yeah, it's actually the same one that we're looking at. Um, so if it's black to play in a position where you see this, like, knight moves, this is like a knight circuit geometry, or it's a square in chess, right? Tilted square. So if the king and the queen and the king and the rook are all in this kind of box formation, this is a souk swap. Another easy one to remember just because of the geometry. So um, this is our goal, one of our goals. If they play like any move that can end in disaster, like if they play this move, you have two, we're checkmating them. And there's no stalemate trick, because they could always play king h1. And if they play a move like this, then it's just a different kind of problem. More checkmating problems. And if they play a move like this, it's just checkmate right. Well, not checkmate right away, but it does not look good. Anyway, you can work it out. Just If you can remember this boxy geometry, you can remember this is a souk swap, and if you can get it, you can win it. Okay, so this position is also a souk swap for similar reasons to the other. Um, so after, for example, king g3, queen h5, it's starting to become like a Philidor position that we already analyzed. One note that I made here when I was preparing this is that it's usually better to try to put your opponent in Suksuang than to um, do something very forcing in situations like this. So queen d5 is just one such move. Um, for example, if they play rook to g2, you can see that they're kind of in peril. Um, they could try to hold on here by playing like king h2. If they, if they play rook f2, the checks just run out. Like after king g3, they're getting back rank mated, or mated on b7, or I'm sorry, g2. So, so they're more likely to play a king move here. Um, king f1 is clearly off limits, so they would have to play king h2. And it's becoming like the Philidor position for real after queen h4. We've already analyzed how to, how to win this. Um, let's see. So in my main line, I gave one final Suk Swan that I just wanted to show you. So in this position, it's white to play. After rook g2, I can create a Suk Swan. Wait, hold on. Did we just look at this? Well, yeah. Shriram, you were late, and I picked this topic just for you. What's the matter? Yeah, I'm actually going to wrap up pretty soon, um, because I had a late start today. I don't think I can keep doing it without having breakfast. So, um, yeah, Queen H4 was the winning move. But check the replay, Shriram, because I, I think I covered a bunch of really um, useful examples. And I might do another one later, where it's Queen against Rook and Pawn. That has its own strategy, so I want to keep them separate. Um, I also have a lot more examples of this that we can look at. And just a sneak peek for next time, we're going to look at this game. So if you're kind of interested to see what happened in this unique starting position, where they castled on move one, and see how this could possibly relate to our um, queen versus rook topic, you should tune in for the next Endgame stream. Okay, so thanks everyone for your support. Um, I'm really glad that we were able to have this stream, and I wish everyone luck with their chess. If you want to join the Discord, if you're not already in it, just leave a comment on YouTube. I will respond with a temporary link, just so we don't get flooded with random people. Um, but yeah, message me. I will respond. And uh, we can all even practice these positions together, if that's what you guys want. So. I'm going to show off the fancy transition that 
the dump made for me, and then sign off.